Hey, Philip, uh, thank you for coming in today and doing this uh, conversation with us. You have an outstanding career in ship design. You definitely would would be, uh, you know, like a, a star within the Stanford community, but then the chip community, in fact, you are because of all the work. And, and you just recently won the top award with the IEEE because of your work in, in, uh, in the whole area of semiconductor design and so on. So, uh, you know, uh, we're going to mine some of that uh, history and the work that you're doing and where, where it continues. And, uh, and so thank you for coming in. Thank you, Catherine, for inviting me to come on to this interview with you. So, Philip, you know, what are maybe two or three inflection points in your life that created this marvelous career as professor of electrical engineering, but also so foundational in all of the areas of semiconductor design? Well, the first inflection got to be uh, I went to college in Hong Kong and I went to the University of Hong Kong and there's a wonderful professor who took me in uh, when I was doing my final year project. Every every student needs to do a project at the final year. So it's all like a capstone project in the US. And I did this project with my professor. He uh, he was uh, actually new to the university and uh, didn't know what can be done and what cannot be done. And uh, he tried everything. Uh, I ended up uh, building the very first transistors for the university. And uh, <laughs> it was a... Uh, history for the university and of, of course a turning point for myself as well. Uh, that's probably the first turning point and I was forever grateful for my advisors uh, uh, willingness to take me in even though I was a, a greenhorn and, uh, and didn't know anything about semiconductor devices and I basically learned everything from the beginning with from him and uh, it was a wonderful experience. So uh, years later uh, I'm a professor now and I look back at this uh, experience and uh, that gives me all the uh, kind of in impetus to uh, work with the undergraduate students and uh, make sure that every one of them gets their chances to uh, showcase their own strength and uh, go forth in their career and that yeah, that is one of the most exciting things uh, or kind of turning points in my career uh, so to speak. Well the second turning point would be uh, when I went to uh, uh, the graduate school in the U.S. I met my professor, Professor Marvin White, uh, who is, uh, at the time I didn't know that, but now I know that he's a luminary in the field. Uh, he uh, invented many things, among them the uh, uh, correlated double sampling circuits that everybody used in the camera, including the camera that you're using today to uh, record this, uh, uh, this uh, video. So uh, he recently got the Emmy Award uh, for inventing this uh, circuit in here. Uh, so the, I went with him and uh, for my PhD, and he is a wonderful mentor. He worked in the industry for many years before becoming a professor at Lehigh University, where I went to school for PhD. And uh, he took me in, and uh, that basically educated me for all the things that I needed to do, uh, in academic wise, and also for, from the point of view of how to. Uh, work with other people, how to network, how to uh, uh, participate in the technical community and I learned everything from him. And it was a wonderful experience as well. He had a big research group and uh, all the students that are in the group have been fantastic and they become lifelong friends uh, even after I graduate. So that was a wonderful experience. And uh, after I graduated, he, uh, because of his huge network of friends in the, in the, in the, in the industry, I had no problem finding any, job, any finding jobs and I got tons of offers from everybody. And uh, I ended up at uh, IBM Research at the Oktan Heights, New York. And my uh, first uh, manager was uh, very accommodating and also extremely nice person and uh, helped me a lot in my career within IBM. And uh, from there on, I think that there are many, many turning points, but I think if you have to point out uh, three uh, career turning points, it would be one, my advisor at the undergraduate university, Professor Y.C. Chen, and my PhD advisor, uh, Professor Martin White at the High University, and also my first manager at IBM who gave me this opportunity to join this wonderful research laboratory at, at a time. 
Yeah, it's an interesting uh, history and narrative from uh, early in your life and it really being mentored uh, by, by these other uh, notable uh, professors and so on and to your career. And then uh, also also at IBM, but e at each point in in your career, you've been doing marvelous work. You know, you've been inventing or creating, um, and now you're at Stanford. So talk about um, what you're doing at Stanford. Okay, um, I work in semiconductor devices all my career, uh, starting from the days, as I said, from the days when I was an undergraduate student. I worked on semiconductor devices. And at IBM, I work on two main, three main things. One is work on uh, electronic imaging, and uh, we work on the early, uh, the early stages of very large area, very large high capacity, high resolution imaging, and also some of the CMOS image sensors that we all use today. And I also work on advanced uh, semiconductors like transistors, building advanced transistors, um, and I was at the. I was first doing my own research and uh, then managing a research group at IBM Research to uh, to develop the, the future generations of device technology. And then later on at IBM, I work on more, even further out in terms of time horizon. At the time, nanotechnology was uh, invoked and everything is becoming small and, and nano. So when I went to uh, Stanford in 2004, I started uh, working on the further out aspects of the research, um, uh, working on nanotechnology, nanoscience, and basically translating the discoveries in nanoscience and technology into practical technology. That was one of uh, the, the main kind of research thrusts that I have at, uh, at, at Stanford. I work on several things at Stanford, one on the, what we call transistor or logic technology, uh, basically transistors that do computation. And the other aspects that I work on is memory technology, whereby uh, you need to have uh, electronic devices that store data and uh, either temporarily or for a long term. For example, in your phone, you have uh, memory devices or actually storage devices to store your uh, phone, uh, phone books or uh, photos and, and whatnot in the, in, the, in the device. So I work on these two main things which uh, basically are uh, essential elements for computing in general. Uh, at Stanford, the, most of the research are further out in terms of time horizon. Uh, at the same time, engineering is a very practical uh, discipline and you need to be, uh, you know, whatever the research you do has to have practical influence, you have to have practical application. So I maintain a very close relationship with many of the companies not only with my former employer at IBM, but also with many other companies, Intel and Samsung and TSMC and, uh, and, other, uh, and other companies that are you know, basically doing research and development in the semiconductor field. So my research has always been very closely tied to industry. And I guess uh, many professors at Stanford do the same as well. Some of them are so get so close as to become the industry themselves, they go <laughs> companies and, and so on and so forth. And that's kind of follow the, uh, the tradition, the long tradition of Stanford being very close to industry and making uh, uh, key contributions to industry. So that's what, what my uh, research at Stanford generally uh, have been. And uh, over the course of years, we have done a variety of things uh, in terms of uh, translating some of these technologies into industry. And we can talk about that a little bit more later. I get, <clears throat> excuse me, it's fascinating, you know, uh, translational research is really where it's at it, from an industry standpoint too. And even really from a research standpoint, because you, you should have some kind of practicality. <laughs> and, and I know your, your, your uh, present research covers areas like uh, carbon electronics. I think that's fascinating. 2D uh, layering materials, again, another fascinating area. Uh, wireless implantable biosensors. In fact, I just did an interview just before yours right now uh, with Dr. Shilin uh, Shen <laughs> and the work he's doing at the Tarasaki Institute. But, uh, you know, they work on things like, like this. I'd be interested in where your work is leading in this area, directed self-assembly, uh, device modeling, <laughs> brain-inspired computing. Uh, again, uh, really at the forefront, uh, non-volatile memory, uh, monolithic uh, 3D integration, uh, I think that's all, all really fascinating. 
I was looking at a video uh, you did recently and, and you were using RAM and 3D architectures and really this really tight integration of RAM with, with you know, the, the sort of the computing components where you get this massive acceleration and um, much lower power draw as well. And it'd be interesting to see where that kind of uh, work is going. So let's let's see if we can get into some of the, the futuristic stuff <laughs> um, because that, it, that will be not the future, it'll be the reality. And then also some of the work, uh, I, I know you took a couple of years uh, to be to, to be the vice president of innovation, really the innovation side for Taiwan Semiconductor, and they're so famous, right? I mean, really the largest uh, fab uh, fabricator in the world, right? Um, and I would say, you know, two, three years ahead of anybody else. Uh, so um, you probably can't talk a lot about that work, but <laughs> maybe we can touch about some of the research parts that you publish and so on. So so first of all, um, um, your interest in carbon electronics and where do you see that going uh, presently and into the future? I'm glad you asked about it. Uh, this is one of the topics. I work on many topics, as you mentioned, right? And this is one of the topics that I've worked on for the longest time. Uh, in addition to silicon transistor, of course, right? I've worked on silicon transistor for a very, very long time. But carbon nanog electronics is something that I work on for a long time. Uh, back in the days when I was at IBM, around maybe late uh, uh, 1990s, in the late 1990s, um, the carbon nanotube was discovered on the mid 90s. Uh, the carbon nanotube was discovered by by various uh, scientists in the, uh, around the world, and uh, my colleagues Fred Navarez and uh, uh, Richard Matau at IBM has uh, in 1998 published the very first transistors made out of carbon nanotubes. And carbon nanotubes, for those who don't know, is a basically a sheet of carbon uh, organized in a honeycomb st structure and rolled up into a, a tube. That's why it's carbon nanotube. It's a tube, it's only a, a one or two nanometer, mostly more, more closer to one nanometer in diameter. So it's a really wonderful, uh, uh, fantastic uh, scientific discovery and the fact that Fed and Forrest and uh, Richard Mattel was able to make a transistor out of this new material was quite amazing. At the time, uh, another group at Delft University almost simultaneously published another paper uh, showing uh, almost at the same month, uh, uh, showing also a carbon energy transistor. So it's not just a one, one off uh, de demonstration. It is uh, uh, done independently by another group uh, uh, halfway around the world, basically. So that looks interesting. At the time, I was, uh, I was very excited about it. And I talked to Fedden and also uh, Richard Mattel and see if I could do something about this uh, really interesting science. Um, uh, because as I said, I'm interested in translating scientific, scientific discovery into uh, practical technology. So I started working on carbon energy with them. And um, at, at IBM, we started looking into various ways to to assess whether the carbon nanotube transistors can become uh, a contender for the future generations of uh, electronic chips, and uh, every time, everywhere we look, every time we looked, uh, there is tremendous opportunity there. Uh, if you could solve some of the uh, basic uh, problems or uh, issues related to bringing new materials into production. So I continued that at, at, uh, at Stanford. And uh, while the first few years I was at Stanford, I was lucky to meet with, an, uh, to, uh, with another colleague uh, at Stanford, Professor Subhashi Smitra. And we actually met each other at the bicycle rack <laughs> in front of our <laughs> office building. <laughs> and, 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 there, and from there, it uh, started a, a, a very long collaboration uh, from probably for both more than a decade of maybe like 15 or 20 years, 15 years of collaboration. And throughout uh, the time, we, uh, my colleague is uh, from computer science. He has a joint appointment in computer science and electrical engineering. So as you can imagine, his uh, angle is more on the uh, system aspects, the system design the system aspects. And I'm more a device technologist working on the, at the same components level. So it's a really wonderful combination. I don't know anything about your system design. 
And so I learned a lot of things from him. And together, we've done a lot of uh, analysis, not only at the device level, but also at the system level. If you build a whole system out of carbon analytics, what, how, would, how would it behave? Is it better than silicon? Is it just is it just a different thing or is it a better thing? Uh, but because being different is different from being better, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, very important. So we've done a lot of, uh, between the two of us, we've done a lot of modeling and analysis and also doing a lot of experimental verification of uh, what to confirm what we uh, expect. And throughout the years, we uh, produce a lot of work, uh, research work and uh, to us maybe like three or four years ago, uh, we finally, got, we are able to, go to uh, uh, get com some confirmation from uh, DAPA. And DAPA has a big program to uh, put new technologies into a foundry. And uh, DAPA actually funded us for a very large project, $62, $62 million uh, to, uh, to put the uh, technologies that we developed, at least the knowledge of, of all the knowledge that we have into a foundry called Skywater in Minnesota. So, the, and at the time we had a really fantastic uh, former students now, Max Schulacher. Uh, is, is, this is a student that comes maybe once in 30 years. Uh, and uh, he was so fantastic. He was able to do a lot of things that nobody else could do. And he graduated and moved to MIT. He was a professor now at MIT. And uh, together he, he did most of the work in moving whatever knowledge is that we have uh, on the common energy into this uh, foundry. And now the, uh, the technology is installed in the foundry and uh, they have it running in there. So that, that's what, that was quite a, uh, a journey from many, many years ago at IBM when, uh, when uh, my colleague uh, Fred Navarro and Richard Mattel was able to make the very first transistor that doesn't look really like that transistor, but it is a transistor. <laughs> But uh, to the point where you could install that into a foundry, and uh, and that's quite a uh, quite a journey in here. And even today, uh, of course, it's not the end of the story. Uh, we uh, there's a lot of things to be done to make sure to make this uh, carbon energy technology to be uh, real a real contender at the leading edge of the uh, of the technology. And that's what I'm working on right now with my uh, friends at uh, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company in Taiwan. And uh, we're working with their researchers to uh, further develop these technologies into a viable uh, leading edge technology node. And so it's quite a long journey from maybe the late nineties to, to today, but it was a wonderful journey. And along the way, we trained many students and uh, and some of them continue the journey into nanotubes, such as uh, Max Schulacher, who's a professor at MIT now, and also some of my former, one of my former students who's at working at TSMC right now, Brett Pittner. Um, the others are have uh, been trained at, as as in all the PhD research in universities, the students get trained and they gain the skill sets required to uh, prosper in uh, in gen in generally speaking in this uh, field. And many of my students uh, who graduated with uh, on working on common tube and move on to do other things, and they have been uh, 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 their careers have flourished. So th this is a wonderful example of how research in a university uh, broadly applicable uh, skill sets for the students. Yeah, uh, again, that's a you know really fascinating um, sort of narrative of where that's going and is continuing to build out. Uh, I'm really interested in the, your work with 2D uh, layered materials. Can you give, give uh, ex, talk a little bit about that as well? Interesting, yeah. 2D layered materials came uh, probably after the, the craze for the carbon nanotube came about. And this is also another kind of new material in which the materials are, uh, the atoms are arranged in layers. So that's why they're called two uh, layered materials and arranged in a two dimensional layer. So that's why it's called, called two D layer materials. So you can imagine that as sort of like uh, like the sheets of stuff, and uh, and you stack these sheets and into uh, these are uh, a single atomic layer, or, or uh, each of the two D layer materials is maybe like three atomic layer thick. So it's very very thin. And how do we use that? And um, there are several ways to use. And uh, by the way, if, if your audience are uh, familiar with something called graphene, and graphene is also a 2D layer material. It's a single sheet of carbon. Uh, 
Uh, similar to the carbon nanotube, uh, you take a carbon nanotube and cut a tube and cut it up along the axis, you you unroll it, it becomes a, it is a graphene sheet. All right. So these sheets are very interesting uh, because uh, they have the way the array atoms are arranged, the electronic properties are very different from bulk materials. And uh, and also because the, the, the layers are uh, thin, it is possible that you can make very short uh, transistors, very uh, small transistors, very short gate length uh, transistors. And um, why do we want to make short gate length transistors? Because we want transistors to be smaller. And uh, the smaller, uh, you can pack more transistors onto the, onto the, onto one chip. And there are more transistors, you can do more things. And uh, not only that, uh, you. Not only you can do more functionality uh, in, in technical terms, we can do more things, but also uh, the way it, uh, uh, it, 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 the physics work is that as you get smaller, you would uh, get uh, better energy efficiency. You can uh, do more computation uh, within the same amount of uh, energy being consumed. So that, there's a strong desire to strengthen transistors in the smaller sizes. And the physics of the transistors is such that if you shrink the transistors or transistor, you need to make the, the transistors very thin. And, uh, and that's part of the reason why the people that uh, we're, we're interested in carbon nanotube, which is one nanometer, and for 2D layer materials that are less than a nanometer thick. So it's very uh, thin. So, the, um, so that's part of the reasons. And also they have some interesting properties like graphene has this property which even though it's very at one atomic layer thin, uh, no atoms can get through them. For example, even gas atoms cannot get through the, uh, the, uh, the graphene. So that becomes a very good barrier for, uh, for things. Just like if you do garden work, you have a moisture barrier, right? So this is a very good barrier for just about anything, even for gases. So, the, for example, in the game, for a few years, I worked with my students, uh, former student now, uh, uh, Ling Li, who, who, and, and Helen Chen, who uh, work on graphene as a barrier for copper. Uh, why do we need a copper barrier? Uh, for right now, the, all the wires in the computer chips are made with copper. Uh, but copper is very mobile. They move around if you, and uh, they, go into the, they go into the silicon. Uh, of the silicon chip and mess up the electronic properties of the silicon. So the so you have a wire. You want to have a kind of like a barrier for, for preventing the copper from diffusing away. And uh, and graphene turned out to be a, a tremendously good uh, barrier. And also it's very thin and conductive. So that's important because uh, you want to, you don't want the non-conducting material to eat up uh, a space in here. So we work on the graphene or uh, uh, using it as a copper barrier. And, uh, and today many companies are uh, exploring this direction right now, uh, starting from the, our initial uh, the investigation many, many years ago. And uh, so in the 2D layer materials, uh, there are a lot of research work right now going on around the world. We try to make these into uh, transistors, very short gating transistors. And so uh, my student and I also uh, have studied uh, some of the fundamental properties. And uh, there we collaborate with many colleagues, for example, like Eric Pop, Professor Eric Pop at Stanford. We, and uh, we collaborate with him and his students uh, to figure out some of the fundamental properties, such as contact resistances, how to make good contacts, how to make sure that the uh, uh, electronic carriers move along the materials uh, smoothly with high speed. So we do these kinds of uh, fundamental studies to ascertain that uh, these these materials, when you make them into actual working transistors, they will actually perform well. And so that's kind of like our journey in there. And part of the thing is that, that both the nanotube, I should uh, mention that the nanotube and the 2 d layer materials, you can fabricate these to transistors at very low temperature. And that leads us to uh, the kinds of research that we are, I'm working on very, uh, very uh, actively today, uh, in namely how to build, build electronic chips in 3D, in three dimensions. And uh, today in silicon transistors, you need to uh, go through very high temperature fabrication processes, or oftentimes more than a thousand degrees Celsius. 
And that uh, is kind of, and the way we make them is we go through the high temperature processes to make the transistor first. And then we put down at low temperature, these metal wires, like copper wires. And, uh, but these copper wires cannot, it's, it would, withstand, and the insulators that surrounds them uh, cannot withstand the high temperature process. So you do the high temperature process first, do the low temperature process to put down the wires, and then you complete uh, one level of this chip. But in the future world, if we want to build more transistors on the chip, we need to build devices, maybe transistors and memory and, and so on, on, on top of each other, just like building a skyscraper. Uh, you know, you, you go from a Manhattan, a Los Angeles type uh, arrangement of transistors and, and devices into a Manhattan type uh, uh, style uh, going up in 3D. And that gives you uh, the ability to build more transistors on the onto a, a silicon chip, onto a, a computer chip. And that gives, as I mentioned before, more transistors give you more functionality and you can do more things with the chip itself. So that's where the future direction is. But in order to uh, realize that vision, you need to be able to make devices in the, in the third dimension. And uh, that requires you to select, uh, pick, uh, materials to build devices and, and wires that can be made at low temperatures so that they can be compatible with each other while you can build it one layer and another layer and another layer uh, without destroying those uh, devices that have been built in the in the bottom. So that's the, both the 2D layer materials and the uh, carbon nanotubes can be made at low temperature. And that's where we are, then that's why we, uh, our research has focused on these materials and devices that can be fabricated at low temperatures. You know, I'm just curious then, I mean, you're, you're dealing with these uh, 2D layered materials, you're talking about graphene, so pristine graphene has quantum properties, and maybe there could be uh, some kind of extension of that research into room temperature quantum computing uh, at a fundamental level. I mean, uh, some of the problems still have to be addressed, perhaps uh, uh, on superposition and entanglement. Do you see any of that as possibilities on these 2D uh, materials specifically uh, with uh, pristine graphene? Uh, I'm not familiar, too familiar with the quantum computing uh, aspects of it, but uh, generally speaking, uh, you really need uh, new materials or materials that we don't normally use today to perform these uh, uh, quantum entanglement to build into qubits. And also yeah, beyond the qubits, you need control circuitries at low temperatures. So the, and to build a complex uh, uh, quantum computer, you really need a, a lot of engineering effort beyond what we can see, what we are seeing today. And uh, all these developments that we see in, the, in classical uh, computing uh, devices uh, are gonna be very useful. And in fact, even in classical the devices, there are a lot of quantum effects in, <laughs> you know, in plain old silicon transistors that we use in, uh, in our computers and phones today quantum effects are in display every day. And uh, we count on those quantum effects. Uh, in fact, uh, one very simple example, uh, the memory uh, that we use in storing the data, like your photos in your phone, they require on quantum mechanical tunneling. And uh, without quantum mechanical tun tunneling, those devices uh, don't work. So, uh, so we, are, we are using quantum effects every day uh, for many years now. So there's nothing new, in fact. <laughs> You know, you talk about monolithic uh, 3D integration and, and how you're working with that. You can see the advantages of low temperature. And um, I recall seeing an announcement, maybe but maybe a year ago, something like that, where you you were working on some kind of architecture where you had RAM, uh, which is much, much uh, better than, than what we have today. And then this really, really tight integration on chip with, with the computing components so that you get this massive increase in, in uh, speed, but also you get this much lower power consumption. Can you talk more about that work? And I think you're doing some of that work with Taiwan Semiconductor as well, right? So. Yeah, so the, the, this, uh, absolutely, you, you hit upon a very important uh, research trend or technology trend uh, we have today, and which is the fact that the um, computing requires not only uh, a very high, uh, energy efficient and high speed computation itself, but when you do computation, you need data. Uh, you need <laughs> data to compute on, otherwise, uh, what are you computing on, right? So you need to add numbers, you need to multiply numbers and things like that. So where do the data come from? 
the data can come from, of course, come from the external world. You enter the data, you capture the phone, uh, capture a picture and things like that. And so the data, uh, typically right now, um, uh, the uh, process of uh, building a memory devices such as dynamic random access memory, DRAM, or a flash memory that, that where you store your data, phone data, your photos on, those memory exists uh, are built on a different uh, fabrication processes than the logic transistors where you do the computation. And uh, as a result of that, and a part of that, uh, and also due to cost, on cost optimization, those exist on separate chips. So you have a chip for computing, you have another chip for storing the, the data. And so now in order to get to data for com to do the computation, you need to move the data from the memory chip to the compute chip. The movement, the move, the actual, the act of moving these data from the memory chip to the compute chip uh, requires a lot of energy and uh, burns a lot of power and also requires time uh, later in computer uh, architecture terms called latency, uh, how much time you need to wait to wait for the data to come. And so the, um, over the time, the, uh, the advances in computation in the transistor logic technology has advanced uh, tremendously, whereas the, uh, um, the protocols or the methods to move the data from the uh, memory chip to the computer chip has, hasn't improved as fast. So over time, a, a, a gap has opened up and, uh, and in, in, a, in, the, in the sense that you can compute very fast, but you don't have the data. You're waiting for data to come. <laughs> and so that's not good, right? So the, and uh, so this is one of the biggest, biggest things that uh, technical issues that the research community, uh, the technical community has to, uh, is solving uh, today uh, from you know, coming up with new architecture, uh, like for example, building uh, accelerator, what people call accelerators, to coming up with new device technology that could uh, solve this problem. One of the uh, possible solutions would be to build the memory right on top of the computation chip instead of having it on a separate chip. And um, and one vision that we have is to build this in 3D. So you have compute chip. You have the memory elements, the memory in a different layer on the same chip, so that you can have massive connections between the uh, memory uh, elements to the compute elements. So you have massive uh, parallel, massively parallel access, and so therefore, therefore, you can have access to the data in parallel very quickly and in computer uh, architecture terms, high bandwidth and with low latency, because now you are not getting the data many, many miles away uh, in a separate chip, but rather you're right on the same chip. It's like, instead of going to the next town to get your food, you're growing your own food in your own <laughs> in your home. So it's much easier access and much more efficient, energy efficient. So that's where we think, at least I think, and my colleague, Kusawashi Mitra and many of my colleagues there at Stanford think that uh, integrating and think in 3D will be the way to go. So. Uh, so that uh, calls for research in two things that I'm working on right now. Uh, one with the research on memory devices that can be built in 3D. And so there is this, uh, what you mentioned, RM, which is switching memory, uh, random access memory, and other memory technologies that other people have been working on, like uh, magnetic memory, random access memory, like MRAM, thermoelectric memory, uh, FRAM, FUM, and so on. So many other memory devices that uh, are basically a plethora of devices that people are working on, they all can be made on top of the logic of uh, computing chip. And so then the next thing that uh, one can think of is how do you make use of these the, the, the good attributes of all these new memory technologies beyond the traditional ones that exist on, on separate chips? How do you make use of these good attributes of all these technologies into and combine them in a good way, uh, architectural wise, you know, to derive the, the benefits that you see. So part of the research work is working on the memory device that itself and improving and coming up with new memory device to technology and giving good, good characteristics such as uh, easy to write, easy to read and fast read and write and low energy access and so on, but also ways to integrate them in 3D. And uh, part of the work that you may be referring to 
is uh, my student uh, uh, had been working on uh, understanding the, the proper or testing out uh, proper architecture to use, let's say, resistive ransom access memory RAM, and how do you use that in, combina in combination with transistor technology to give you uh, uh, good computational, high energy efficient uh, computation. And many of the computation that we're doing today has to do with AI, like uh, machine learning, and uh, doing uh, learning and influencing and so on. And one of the recent work that my student have published uh, involved putting together uh, three million RMs on top of a computing chip. And uh, it can do a variety of neural networks from various kinds of neural network topologies and showing that uh, it is uh, more energy efficient to do so. And uh, so this is kind of like the research direction that uh, several of my students, uh, former students have been doing and some of the current students are doing as well. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely see the applications on AI on the edge and uh, <clears throat> especially this aspect of sensors out there and, and having on board rather than going through the cloud, right? Where absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because uh, sensors on board and also you know, we need to be able to uh, process data right at the source, right at the sensor end, right. uh, and to uh, eliminate or minimize the amount of data that needs to be moved from the sensor end to, let's say, the data center and uh, where the main computer is. Uh, for example, if you think about, uh, let's take a um, take a trip to the future and say, <laughs> okay, twenty years from now, how do we interact with uh, with computing devices? And I think we won't be interacting with computing devices using our phones or even our computer. It will be some other things that we interact with the computer. Just like if you look back twenty years, uh, phones were like bricks, <laughs> right? This big, right? And who would have imagined that phone would become uh, uh, so, such a powerful thing and so small that we all carry around? Uh, whereas 20 years ago, the, uh, only very few people has this brick type phones. So. And so if you fast forward 20 years, then the phones that we have today probably look will look very clunky and you know, and people will laugh at that. So <laughs> who would use these phones <laughs> 20 years later? So I think uh, those kinds of innovations requires a lot of uh, those kinds of uh, uh, scenario probably will come will come when the device hardware devices make uh, tremendous advances, uh, uh, along with of course software applications. That nowadays you cannot have any hardware devices without any software, right? So the software has to come along with it as well. But uh, just like walking with two legs, you know, you have to have both the software and the hardware go hand in hand, and that's quite important. And that's one of the things that I've been working with uh, with my academic friends in, in, at Stanford and also out, elsewhere, and uh, which is to to improve the or lower the energy barrier for access for students to touch the hardware. Uh, if you because I believe that uh, future world would require not only software but also a, the appropriate hardware, you know, even in a metaverse. Uh, you need some <laughs> physical thing to enter the world, the, the, the virtual world. And what is that physical thing and to enter the virtual world? And even in the virtual world, there's a, tons of computation required to, to be that exists in the virtual world. And who is doing the computation? There's some computing devices. And those computing devices would be would have to be a lot more energy efficient than we than the computing devices that we have today. Right. And so educating students to in, in terms of being able to have uh, access to uh, uh, to experiment with hardware devices is clearly important. If you think about it today, uh, students in high school can easily buy a couple hundred dollars computers uh, or even go to the library and access the computer and write a piece of software and uh, and do something very uh, exciting about it. Uh, you can build an app, you can, uh, you can put up an app and put it on the app store, you can sell, you can sell the app as well even for high school students. And of course, at, uh, at many universities worldwide today, uh, at East of Stanford, uh, a vast majority of the students have uh, taken computer science classes. And because now uh, uh, being able to write software is, uh, or at least understand a software has become a language skills. Uh, <laughs> speaking uh, speaking uh, 
English or or, or Spanish and, and Chinese and so on. So that is a clearly an important language skill. And software becomes a, 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 a something that almost all students need to touch. But if you, in a future world, I think uh, the future world would consist of both software and hardware advances. And uh, so being able to provide students with uh, uh, access to hardware and experimentation is very important. But hardware access to hardware experimentation today is has a very high energy barrier, and um, not only because of the uh, the cost of the facilities required, but also because of the uh, of the way we teach and the way that uh, uh, the current generation of hardware technologies requires a uh, very long learning curve. And one of the key questions that we want, like we would like to ask ourselves is, how do we lower the energy barrier for students to access uh, uh, hardware and touch the hardware so they can, they can start experimenting, they can start uh, getting uh, exposed to the possibilities. And that's some of the things that I think that would make a tremendous, uh, if we can lower the energy barrier for students to access hardware, um, experimentation or learning how to, do, how to work with hardware, that would be a really revolutionary uh, change to society. Uh, because right now you can see that the, the advances in software has been tremendously rapid, but pretty soon they run out of steam uh, because the the hardware is not catching up. And so, so you need to have uh, both uh, working uh, advancing at the same pace. You know, I just want to touch on one other aspect, you know, um, you know, this idea of uh, incorporating a system uh, on a chip in some way. So let's say you've got, uh, and I don't know if you can do this on a, your uh, monolithic 3D integration, but analog components in there as well. So you got analog combined with digital and sort of the best of breed, and you're combining the latest memory technologies and you're getting the massive parallelization occurring because it's all on chip. Are you working in that area as well? So you're, you're getting more of a system and not just the digital, but also the analog. And then why are, where do you see, if you're doing this, then where do you see analog uh, contributing to the overall solution paradigm that's out there? Absolutely, you, 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 you point out a key point. And historically, uh, the advances in, in the past, uh, the advances in device technology has seemed so rapid that uh, basically, you did you discover something or you, or you you bring something to 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 the market and people figure out what to do with it and uh because the the advances have been so tremendous so so the step has been so big that uh, uh being able to find applications is clearly no problem at all uh, more more recently, I think the 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 way technologies are being developed is more instead of being more driven from the bottom, uh, it's more driven from the top. Uh, now what I mean by that is that we start from what you want to do. Um, let's say you want to enter the metaverse, right? <laughs> uh, this is what you want to do, and then you feel, you go down one step down and say and ask. What kind of software or hardware do we do I need to enable me to do that? If you want to have a VR headset, what does that mean? Well, that means it has to be small, it cannot be clunky, and uh, that means that you need is to have low power consumption. Okay, then you ask, okay, what can I do to to achieve that? So it goes down, it comes down from the top from what you want to do, and then filter down into what are the requirements? What, what do I need to have? What do I need to develop in terms of hardware and software technology to realize that uh, uh, that vision or that application? So the, today, the system view is clearly important. So the, any new device technology that uh, that one would uh, advocate for has to have a system view, has to say, okay, if I have these new devices, where does it sit into a system, into a, prototypical system where, did, where 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 is that being used and and how would how would using that uh give you a better system performance not just different as i mentioned before <laughs> being different is different from uh it's, it's not the same as being better right so how is it going to be better than what you can do otherwise and those system level analysis is pretty important and that's what we 
ask all our students to to um, to pay attention to, and uh, oftentimes do the research on, namely to uh, assess and characterize your devices in such a way that you can then go one level or several levels up to to assess whether when you build a system like that, what kind of benefits do you get? And that's clearly important. You know, we're, we're down to our last question. Unfortunately, you know what? I could spend half a day <laughs> just mining all of the work that you're doing and just uh, so fascinating and, you know, really profound. It's, it's going to uh, impact the world and it's for the benefit of humanity and Earth ecosystems. I wish we had, had more time to get into the wireless implantable biosensors. I did that itself. I think it's fascinating. Your directed self-assembly, your device modeling. You've touched on some of this, but you know, we need more time to get into your like your brain inspired computing and some of these other areas of your work. And then even uh, also all of your past work. And um we only have time for one last question, unfortunately. I hope we can do more interviews so, so we can we can look at some of these other aspects of your work. You know, what final recommendations would you leave to the audience? And my audience is very varied. So there's students in there, but there's also computing scientists, there's engineers, there's also a lot of CEOs and investors as well. And so it's a really big bucket of people who uh, follow my interviews. So <laughs> what kind of uh, advice would you give? Or maybe you need to segment it, like your, like your layers on your uh, chips, 3D chips. But yeah, Well, thank you for asking this question. I think there are two, two aspects I would like to uh, say in, as a, a final uh, comment. One is, uh, in the future world, uh, technology is going to be clearly important, as you see in recent times, that uh, economic uh, development and economic security and uh, uh, path towards uh, better lives for everybody in society clearly hinges upon technology development, uh, advanced technology. And much of that counts on um, computing technology, for example. Of course, the the computing technology uh, are able to spread out in many other areas, for example, is the same skill set and the same uh, fabrication technology that one would use for, let's say, biomedical electronic devices, uh, implantable brain implants, and so on. And, uh, uh, and also, for example, in battery uh, the technology, many of the skills and basic sciences and also even practical <clears throat> process technology uh, came, uh, kind of stem from the uh, research in, uh, in computer chips. And so, <laughs> and those, and semiconductor technology is really a foundational technology for many of the things that the society does. And so I would expect that that would be uh, even more important as time go on and you hear about chip shortages and so on, but that's only a, a tip of the iceberg. And the real reason is that this is a foundational technology uh, that uh, will be uh, carrying the weight of the uh, many of the technology advancement and economic advancement that can stem from that uh, going forward. So that's a very important aspect. Second is that uh, we really need to find a way to uh, lower the energy barrier for students to access hardware technologies in general, not just semiconductor, of course, but also the rest of the building systems um, uh, that uh, either computing systems, robotic systems, or other systems that, uh, because the world cannot just exist with uh, software technologies. Uh, you cannot run today's software on a phone that was 20 years ago. Uh, it just doesn't doesn't work, well, right? And I, and I found that out because I I want to keep my phone for the uh, uh, you I want to use my old phone, but I cannot because the software get updated and my phone gets so slow, it doesn't work eventually. <laughs> Even though the phone is perfectly good, the software <laughs> make it inoperable. So you really need to have uh, hardware technology go hand in hand with the software. And I think if you are yeah, uh, uh, for CEOs and company uh, executive, it is important to realize that uh, 
even though in the past uh, decade or two, we see tremendous advances in the software applications uh, going forward. It's more just like a pendulum. Uh, you, you, uh, the pendulum will swing back and, uh, and eventually the hardware technology will become the kind of bottleneck for advances in technology. And so we need to find a way to make sure that the hardware technology also advances uh, as rapidly as the software technology that we have seen in the past 20, 20, 20 some years. And so that's kind of like an important trend, uh, broadly speaking, um, not just only speaking in terms of uh, uh, specifically on semiconductor technology, but broadly speaking, hardware technology has to really go hand in hand in the future. Uh, to help us move forward. And this, this is so foundational to all of everything that we do. Uh, if you look at the uh, United Nations uh, uh, 17 the goals for uh, sustainable economic development, a good majority of them, I counted maybe like 13, 14 of them, uh, depend on advances in, 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 in the technology or computing technology in general. So that's a very important part, and uh, and the society really uh, would benefit greatly from advances in these fields. You know, I I actually helped uh, work on the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the Millennium Goals before that in 2000. So I would say all 17, and really <laughs> even foundational to that is your work, because you're like the atoms that make up the molecules that make up materials and so on. Your work is even foundation to everything else because you work at such a uh, you know basic level building block level really the semiconductor technology drives everything else ultimately right so yeah and your work is just outstanding uh, you know, really thank you for coming in and sharing some of your insights with our audience uh, and your work continues to impact the world for the benefit of humanity and earth ecosystems and will be felt uh, as inflection points throughout our history as well so thank you again for coming in Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.